I mean, I think for most, for most people, mm -hmm. Thursday was a brilliant day. And I think it's important, it's important to say that, really, because I think that the, there were something around 1.4 million people on strike. There was a real feeling, I think, at the demonstration, to, really, of, of anger and a kind of joy about being out the door, really. I was on the London demonstration, which filled up Trafalgar Square, right, and stuff about it. Loads of young primary school teachers, mainly women workers, people from the councils, right, and the rest of it, and a feeling that we were really, we were really hitting back on the day. And if you think about how people felt after the elections and stuff with a vote for UKIP, the other thing about it is it's an absolute joy to see black and white workers, right, and stuff out in the streets together, right, and stuff, and it's the best possible answer to, to, to the kind of argues of disunity that there is. Now, there are, there are small examples as well, and they're small examples, but examples of how you can see. I hope like some of the people who talk, talk about this, how these strikes can begin to pull in other layers that, out on, up, that, 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 that aren't striking over the, key, over the key issue on the day. It's interesting, King's College was out on strike in London because they wanted to strike on the, on the 10th. Tip Transport for London were out on strike because they wanted to strike on the 10th. There was what happened to Donington. There was a, somebody, Tim who's here and stuff, should explain what happened at his call centre on, on, on the day and the rest of it. You can see how these days can become a focus for everybody who wants to see serious resistance uh, uh, serious resistance against, against, against the government. I'm going to talk about, in the, in the talk, the importance of a whole number of local disputes. But I want to argue really hard that the issue of national action right, is absolutely key. When you talk about taking on austerity, local disputes are an important part of that, but you can't take on a government austerity programme, workplace by workplace, college by college, school by school, or whatever. You have to have a national response. In the next few weeks, it's absolutely urgent that we're at the centre, the socialists at the centre, of agitating for that was step one. Now we need, now we need to go on to, to round two. The obvious thing is the government declared that the strike was a complete failure. The local government employers declared that 95% of council workers um, didn't go on strike at all, actually, right, stuff up over it. But of course the response then is to say that this complete and utter failure that is a complete joke and we shouldn't take any notice of is proof why we need to tighten the anti-trade union laws and make sure that this hor horrific event can never happen again. <laughs> right, stuff like that. So that's, that's, what, that's one thing to keep in mind, not mind actually. And the other thing really is stuff, you know, is, is another reason why, why I think they are so worried, worried about it, right, stuff, you can see one little sign of it, firefighters, no movement for 12 months, they come out on, on the 10th and an offer that had been taken off the table suddenly turns up again, right, and stuff about it, there's a feeling of momentum, right, and stuff over it and it, and it begins to worry the, the, the other side. It's the biggest strike, obviously, since we've had, since November 2000, uh, since, since 2011, and that 2011, so a rising wave of, 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 of struggle that was led predominantly in the early part of it in June by the small, by the small and non-affiliated unions, the NUT, UCU, the PCS, uh, uh, the, the PCS and, and, and the rest of it. But we all kind of know the story, don't we, about what happened there. We had the strike in November 2011. There was two and a half million people out. There was a real feeling that we could get to grips with, with, with the government, but the big unions pulled back. The GMB and Unison, and Unison pulled back. And despite rearguard actions all across 2012, the unions that had led the, the, the struggle in 2011 weren't able or didn't feel confident or weren't able to, weren't able to lead a, 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 res, a resistance at a, a, a big enough level and stuff and we've been suffering from the consequences since and I think whole layers of activists <coughs> in the movement are quite scarred by the experience of going up the hill as it were and coming back, uh, uh, coming back down again and I think that there's a, a fear amongst whole numbers of activists inside the movement that we've been here before, we've had big days before but is it going to be taken away, away from us really and stuff and I know there's lots of talking unions like the NUT and it, it, in the PCS and other unions about you know come on let's look it is Prentice Day, Prentice after all, it will pull back quiet stuff around it and actually some of those discussions happen not just about what happens in the autumn but they were also discussions about whether the strike on, on, the, temp, on, the, on the 10th of July were, 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 was going to go ahead at all. And it seems to me that the, the, the retreat in 2011 did, opened up a whole series of debates inside the movement over, over a whole number of issues. One thing is, by the way, about the 24-hour strikes. There's arguments that really, you know, people talk about these big strikes in 2011, but did they achieve anything? You know, after all, you know, lots of the pensions changes happened predominantly and stuff like around it. That was one arg argument that, that, that's come through. But there were more fundamental arguments that developed, really. Right, stuff, you know, is the failure to break through part of a sign of, 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 of the, the, the structural changes inside the working
working class, meaning our side is incapable, really, of taking on the employees in the old ways. We heard lots of these arguments around Grangemouth, for example, about the power of multinational capital, right, and stuff like that. We hold lots of these discussions around the issues about zero hours contracts and other things. There have been arguments that perhaps collective power, uh, perhaps collective power has been, uh, has been un undermined at quite, a at quite a serious level. And obviously, as well, we've also heard arguments about the, the, the power of the anti union laws, right, and stuff over it to hold, to, to hold, hold workers back as well. There's also been a quite ingrained pes pessimism, I, I think, on a, num a number of issues that's come out from the issues of, 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 the, uh, of the issues of the trade union bureaucracy it, 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 it's itself. The idea that because were, because the big unions pulled back in 2011, that it was going to be absolutely impossible to push the likes of Dave Prentice or to push the, 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 the GMB and other unions in, in, into, into fight. Into fight, and we've seen that in in number in number in, in numbers of ways. We've seen people break from Unison, for example, to join breakaway unions or to go over to Unite because the argument is it's a more left-wing union, therefore you can change ch ch change change things in, 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 that, in, that, in that way. And you've also had arguments, really, I think amongst the kind of the, the, the unions that led 2011 that, that I think are quite pessimistic arguments about a way forward. We had a, a big debate inside the NUT about working alongside the NACWT. Now, of course, it's good to strike alongside the NACWT. That's a good move to do, but the argument you couldn't strike at all about the NAS or you couldn't influence the movement to, to get other people out of the door right, stuff w w w was a very pessimistic argument. Inside the PCS, I think one of the arguments around merger with Unite has been an argument that the PCS played a certain role, punched through a certain way, but it, it run out of steam. Was it were, and the only answer was become part of a wide, a, a, a wide union in lots of ways, no matter what the price of, of, of that of that merger of, of that merger would be. Now we've talked for a long time about a situation inside the working class where there is clearly a massive anger about what's going on, right? So people know all the all the all the horrors that are happening to them, right? So, but at the same time, where people lack confidence and they certainly lack, lack organised rank and file organisation, the sort of things we saw in the 60s and 70s or, 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 on the ground. And that means, it seems to me, that the role of the trade union officials has been absolutely central over the last period. Why? Because every time they ballot us, every time they call a demonstration, every time they call us on strike, predominantly, we respond brilliantly. Right, so that's the truth of it, right, stuff over it, and actually two, the, the, the strikes into, into, uh, on, the, on Thursday were an example of that. I'm sure everybody who's out on strike was dead worried the day before, what's going to happen to my school, what's going to happen to the council, and you get the reports coming in, you know, 5,000 in Leeds, 1,500 people, whatever it was, or 1,000 people in Norwich, all the rest of the stuff about it, you know, we, people, our side responds really, really well, but the problem is that the pressure and the organisation that if it existed in 2011 could have stopped the pullback in lots of places doesn't exist. So, for example, in the firefighters dispute, there has been rank and file pressure beginning to develop on the leadership, but it's happened over a two and three year period to get the, to get, to get the, esca the, the, the escalation, um, the, es the, the level of escalation that there is at this stage. And by the way, I just want to remind people, anybody who thinks they're going to have a rest after Marxism, right, stuff so tomorrow morning the firefighters are out on strike between six and eight o'clock, right, and stuff, so that'll be the audience participation bit of, 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 of the day. See, the issue of the officials, it's an important thing really and stuff, and the SWP is something particularly to say about the role of the officials, because it's not for us, either that we, we kind of glorify certain figures on the left and the rest, the rest of it as that and say we can just simply put our faith in them. It's also not the case that we simply denounce people and stuff, and our default position is to denounce the national uh, uh, officials. We've got, uh, we've got, we look at it in a different way. The first thing is, it does make a difference to have left officials. We know that, right, and stuff. When somebody like, you know, when Emma McCluskey or Christine Blower or Matt Rat get up and talk about the denouncing austerity, when Emma McCluskey talks about the need for civil disobedience, it opens up an argument. When he talks about the need for a new workers' party, it certainly start, opens up a discussion, even though I'm going to come on to what, 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 what that means, what that means in, 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 in a second, right? So, but as we've seen over the last couple of days, left officials sometimes can fail to call action. That was a big argument we had around the Grange Mouth disputes, possibility of what could have happened to the rest of it, and sometimes right-wing officials can call the action. It's Prentice who's been the leading figure over this way around, it's Prentice who's balloting the health workers to come out, right, stuff around it, so we can't
largest amount of default position, it, 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 see, it seems to me, of denunciation. But we have to have a knowledge of the role the officials play, and they play as, they are specific, a specific layer inside society. They're not workers, they're not bosses, they negotiate, and therefore they're under pressure, right, and stuff from various forces inside society. Sometimes they're under pressure from below. It's certainly the case at the minute and stuff, not in the most organised way, but lots of workers need something done around pay, and the, and, and the officials can feel that. They're also under pressure from a government and employers who quite often don't want to negotiate over this situation are intransigent and therefore they need to show they've got muscle in the situation and they're also under pressure from, 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 from Labour as well. And we saw that back in 2011 when the strikes were most successful, actually Labour at the time, Miliband and people condemned the, the, the strikes. I want to talk about Labour really because it seems to me there's real bitterness at the minute inside the movement about, about Ed Miliband at many levels. Right and stuff over it. He's not the most popular trick in the box, really, and stuff at the, at the moment. From, at the top, there's bitterness, there's bitterness, and we should be clear about that. In the unions that provide Labour's main funding, if you are Dave Prentice and you get treated the way you were in a run up to the Collins Review and the rest of it, right and stuff, right, you can get angry about that. If you're Billy Hayes or somebody who goes out on the stunt and stuff to get funding for Labour and stuff, you can be ang angry by that. We know there were lots of sharp words between, between the Unite leadership around Falkirk right, stuff, and, 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 Ed, and Ed Miliband, though, even, even though when it came down to the review and the rest of it, like, obviously Unite you know, have, have gone along with it and have talked about bank rolling, uh, have, have talked about bank rolling um, the, 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 Labour election, the Labour election campaign. But it was interesting, I was at Unite conference and actually there was a very good debate around the issue of funding Labour, right, and stuff around it, even though, even though Lemma Plus got up and was very clear as saying we've had lots of debates and arguments, the debates and arguments really have to stop now and we have to get in behind Labour, but it wasn't the case they cracked down on the argument, partly because they couldn't crack down on the argument around the funding of Labour because so many Labour Party delegates are fuming about the behaviour right, stuff, 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 uh, 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 of Labour and the rest of it. And it seems to me uh, uh, the arguments that went around the PCS merger and stuff, and the reason why the motion didn't go through at PCA's conference, one of the big reasons around it was the issue of the link with Labour. That's why they couldn't, they couldn't the, the anger that exists about the, what, the way Labour are, are behaving at the minute. And people most mostly know on the ground that it's pretty, you know, that people were angry they didn't get the support. Actually, when Prentice turned around and said that Miliband wants to make up his mind whose side he's on over the public sector strike, that's something that strikes a call with a lot of people who feel they could have at least backed us up on the day or said there might be a reason why we were coming out why and stuff, uh, 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 when, when we haven't had a pay rise for four or, or for four or five years. Now, of course, the strike doesn't hide the fact that there are weaknesses on our side. We know this. Right, and stuff about, you know, in 1979 there were 13 million people in the trade unions. We can go through the figures, right, and stuff about the level of density inside the private sector. We can go through the, the figures and the number of shop stewards that there are compared to where there was in, in, inside the 1980s and the rest of it, right, and stuff. All this is true. But also over the last couple of weeks and months, we've seen some examples that show you some real possibilities. Look at the arguments around zero hours contracts. Right, stuff around it. We were told at one stage that this fundamentally undermined the ability of workers to organise. And yet, we get the Hovis dispute. And yet, we get the dispute at Edinburgh University. And yet, we get the stuff that's going on at London Metropolitan University. We're told if people are on, on precarious contracts that they can't fight back. But then we get the action that's going on at SOAS University amongst the Ali Pay le lecturers and the rest of it and stuff. So we've seen, the, we, we've seen developments over the last few months that show the changes inside the working, working class don't preclude, preclude people beginning to fight back. When you talk about the unorganised and, and, that, and those people who are supposedly self-employed, we just look at the resistance over the umbrella scam that's been going on among, 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 amongst, amongst, ele ele elect amongst electricians and the rest of it. Lots of these issues right, and stuff are about the political will of the trade unions at the top to try to go into new areas, to try to organise right, stuff among, amongst these people. Just look at the strike at, at, at STEM 6 College, where zero hours contracts were introduced to try and get teachers to go on it. And actually, the strike is a beautiful story because they win at the end of the stuff over it. So we've, seen, so we've seen these developments. And we've also seen around the number of key disputes the level of anger that exists. They're touchstones. They don't hide the strike figures. They're not, a, they're not mass waves, but they really show you something about the, the mood around it. You know, places like Eden Hospital where people went out for 11 days. Edinburgh College where they named indefinite action three days at a time. SOAS would have gone out for a lot longer, but they won. Care UK, 34 days out, out on strike. And of course you've got Lambeth College taking part in five to six weeks of strike action, now getting ready to come out again in, 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 in the autumn. And part of the thing about these strikes is the response to them. I think the response to them is pretty incredible. It doesn't happen spontaneously, by the way. Around all these strikes, if you build solidarity around them, 
People respond magnificently to it. It's not that it's natural, though, these days for people to take the collections and the rest of it. You have to rebuild your idea. People should know Lambeth College, what I'm in that period, it's £35,000. Yeah. It's not bad, really, when you think about 100 groups of workers. And actually, when you get, when you pick, I don't know if people ever saw it, when they call a day of action, right, it's on the Facebook page, right, it's up, they call a national day of action in support of the place, and there are a thousand messages of support. Up on, up, up on the thing, right, stuff and people, and actually, interestingly enough, we talk about the way you can use official calls sometimes to, to argue about unofficial activity, six London <coughs> colleges start talking about unofficial walkouts in their support if activists are sacked, right, stuff uh, uh, over it, but I think it shows, it, it shows the kind of level of anger that exists amongst people that, the, that, the, that these kind of disputes are so, uh, are so popular, and the other thing about it really is the level of politicisation. Right stuff that exists amongst people. You may have a lack of rank and file organisation on the ground, but the level of hatred about what's going on, and also the, re the way people associate these things, can see the political offensive against them, is enormous. NHS demonstrations, any NHS demonstration at the minute, or protests, or any discussion at the hospitals, they're unbelievable because people can see the, le the scale of the attack. People know this is the one thing we really want. You go back to what did my dad do in the war? Well, the end of it, you know, they were like my, like my dad, by the way, and stuff. He wasn't in the war, he wasn't that old. But, 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 but you know, it, we won the National Health Service. That was the jewel. If you go on and hit, uh, with the, one of the best things we've done in recent years, I think, is produce a little placard that says Go Vow. Because when you go on the teacher demonstrations, the idea this is overpay, well, of course it's overpay, right? Stuff, but people hate him. There is a visceral hatred for this man, right? Stuff over it because of what he's doing. And we know that over whole numbers of other issues, right? So people are enormously politicised about what goes on. You talk about the KUK dispute, it's all about what's happening to the National Health Service and stuff. And over issues like racism, by the way, it's been really interesting to see the union shift gear over UKIP to start, to start you know, people like Lynn McCluskey signing a statement, people talking about the demonstration in New York. In Doncaster and the rest of it. And actually, the way we operate inside trade unions, if we forget that element, we're crazy. Because we're not talking about issues of bread and butter here. We're talking about the, the issues of pay and pensions being about the, the fundamental attack on living standards. But everybody, but everybody puts these things in a political context about what, what austerity is about and the way they're trying to change our lives. Now, I suppose the last bit really is to try and come back to the thing about can we beat the Tories stuff, really? Because I, I, I think it's really important for us to say that 2014 is not just necessarily going to be a repeat of, of 2011. If we think that, we may as well just go home, to be honest with you, about it. And I don't think that's the situation at all. There are big differences. One of the differences is, it seems to me, about pay is a pretty fundamental <coughs> issue. You can do lots of smoke and mirrors about pensions, whether you've got a good deal or a bad deal. When it takes a while to work it out, you know what's in your pocket really, stuff about it, and it's a difficult thing for them to just simply sw switch off. And we know, by the way, one of the, one of the issues that affects it, when, when Miliband and people say, by the way, if we're re-elected, there's going to be a 1% pay cap, it does rather remove the argument here and stuff, that you can't strike till, you shouldn't strike till after the next election. And it's interesting, by the way, being less than a year away from an election where we are going on strike. It's not the usual, it's not, it's not the usual processes here. The second thing is people are openly talking about escalation. And it's not just the left talking about escalation. When you go to Trafalgar Square and the unison officials are up on the platform talking about the ballot of health workers and talking about the possibility of more days in September and October, right, stuff about it, that is a huge, huge opening. And when you're talking about the ballot of, in unison, 500,000 health workers being balloted and the rest of it, we're not just talking about the possibilities of escalation amongst those who are struck, we're talking about opening the second front on the most political issue, uh, the most political issues possible. And, and like I said, by the way, when you get at the FBU after two or three years of this stuff, finally saying, well, we have to escalate, and by the way, we've called 15 periods of strike action in the next eight days, these things become facts, rather than the sort of things that, that, you know, that are raised at union conferences where we all vote for the general strike, right, stuff about it, they, they, become much more, they become much more serious. And it seems to me we've got to be, without sort of removing our brain and forgetting 2011, we've got to be the people who are, and the people around us, and the people we work with, who are driving really hard now to turn the, 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 the talk about the, t the two days, the talk about the strikes in the autumn, in, into, in, into, rea into reality. There's a massive, massive danger that people just sit back, ah, oh, Prentice, who cares? Yeah, they'll say they'll ballot, they'll never do it. Even if they do, it'll put, you know, at the minute they are opening the door. When they get up and talk about the fact we want the biggest, we've been on the biggest strike in this country since 1926, that should be seen as an open, open season for every activist in Unison, the NUT, and every, every other union to say, yeah, he's right. 
We do want, and we do want two days, right, stuff, and we do want to take out the, 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 the calls that have gone on. I think that means, really, it's a call to arms, isn't it? Whether the summer's coming or not, it, if you're, you know, at the top level, the NEC's and the rest of it, but in every workplace, we should be just bringing a thing out, saying, ah, brilliant was last Thursday. If you were out, let's go out again, hands up, let's send that through to the region head, end to head office. And if you weren't out on strike, we should be passing stuff through saying we want to come out. We want to come out with these people and stuff because if anybody goes to a picket line at the minute, they know the thing. It ain't the lefties raising this. Walk onto a picket line, everybody says we should all be out together. Right, yeah. stuff over it. So it seems to me we have to be at the head of that move rather than being the people on the sidelines who just say it's not possible when it can't happen because that would be a huge, huge, huge mistake. I think the second thing is when we talk about rank and file organisation, right, stuff, you can be, you know, we've got high, you know, at, most people's experience is not rank and file organisation. 99% of us in the room, right, so that is not our experience. So how do we move towards the rank and file or more rank and file self activity? We have to use the official calls that they're putting out in order to put weight and to, and to try and get people moving and to increase self-confidence and self-activity. So the ballot in the NHS, for example, it can be a passive process or it can be somewhere where we're going around, going around at, at the wards of the hospital with recruitment forms, <coughs> pulling stunts, right stuff, letters to the local papers, getting interviews on TV, calling for protests, right stuff. In other words, the whole thing begins to be something where it's increasing the confidence in the rank and file, increasing their ability to be involved. And if somebody at the top says, by the way, we're switching this off, right stuff, when it's not just you moaning about it, it could be you and your 100 mates at your hospital about it. And that's a situation, it seems to me, we have to get at. The build up to the the October, the, 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 the AB demonstration, the TUC are called, yeah, and stuff, you know, if anybody else says about, oh no, another A to B demonstration, if we get five or six hundred thousand people on a demonstration, it will lift people's confidence enormously, so therefore we should be booking the transport now, putting the pressure on the regional officials, where's the staff, where's the leaflets, come on, we want to go, right, so we want to be down on the demonstration, the rest of it, that's the important thing, to be honest with you, the fact that officially Unite will support the demonstration in Doncaster now against UKIP, it's an open door for every Unite activist in the country, we should we're saying Lynn's right, we don't want to be divided, we want to fight. Come on, let's get out of the thing. And we have to think that method all the time about using <coughs> official calls to, in, to encourage the creativity and the, and the activity of the rank and file. When we talk about the stuff we talked about for our last couple of years around the electricians, you have to just think about how they used the support and the days of action that were called officially by the union to build up the idea of unofficial activity underneath it as well. Last couple of things. We also have to fight to develop real networks around, around in, in each area, inside our unions, but across our unions as well. And we talked about it for a long, long time. But it seems to me, in a minute, right stuff. The danger of it is, is there strikes happen, people come to, to, together around them or around protests and the rest of it, and they leave little behind. And it has to stop. Right, so we have to try and fight to build up networks of people that are pushing in the same direction. And we know that will be that will be at different levels. It can happen around solidarity, around disputes. Be honest with the stuff around the People's Assembly demonstration, it was a brilliant opportunity stuff to pull people down and the rest of it. But one of the reasons why we've been talking about this little thing that everybody keeps getting thrown in their hand, United Resistance Conference has been called on the 15th of November, is we know lots of these forums at the minute don't provide a way to, to, to both build solidarity but also to talk about a way forward. And it seems to me we have to try at a national and a local level to try to create those forums amongst workers right, so, so that we are pushing in the same, we are pushing in, we are pushing in the same do, do, direction. The real discussion we're trying to have here is how we break what they, you know, the, the Gordian knot, isn't it? How do you keep going around in a circle, right, and stuff, of big strikes being called, not enough punch underneath to push them through, and then somebody like Prentice or someone else pulling, pulling them off, really, and stuff a, 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 about it. And it seems to me that over the next couple of weeks, and months, the issue of national action will be absolutely central to that process. They, we have to build up a head of steam underneath them saying enough and no more. We are not taking 1%. We're not going to do it. What I stuff about it. And if we can get that wave going, it doesn't guarantee anything, but it does guarantee you something. If you operate in that way, we can begin to build up a side that can put pressure on the officials, right stuff, and begin to open the possibility to other activity happening independent of them, right stuff, if, 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 they, if they don't lead, 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 lead well enough. Last thing of all is just an argument about socialists in the situation, really. Because it seems to me that at the, at the moment, right stuff, you know, that. 
there is a real wish to see resistance. That's what people want to do. They want to see a kickback. That's why when somebody fights, are so popular. I, mean, I remember standing on that Lambeth picket line, every 30 seconds, someone's beeping as you go past and stuff about it. You know, actually, the last tube strike was interesting. Sometimes tube workers can be these, you know, evil villains, right, and stuff, trying to hold London to ransom and the rest of it. There were people, despite the fact there was chaos in London, there were people coming out, bringing packets of biscuits, patting people on the shoulder, right, all this stuff. There's a real wish to do that, really, and stuff about it. But we've got to try and develop that and develop beyond it. We have to try and get a layer of activists inside the working class who understand the stakes that there are, that understand the relationship with the officials, right? So it's not just simply, oh, aren't they wonderful? Or not just simply, let's denounce them, right? So we have to work with and against these people, right? And stuff in, in order to in order to push for th things forward. But also people can offer an explanation of the way the world works and can offer, offer, offer an alternative right, stuff to, 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 to groups of workers who want to, want, want to see resistance on a, on a serious level. I think people are quite open to socialist ideas in that way at the minute. And alongside doing all this stuff, I think we have to fight really hard to do that, to establish networks of people who buy a socialist worker, who, who start to look to socialist ideas and start to look to a kind of rank and file tradition, even if at the minute we're not at a stage where we can produce rank and, rank and file organisations. So just to finish really, I think, you know, it was bloody brilliant being back out on the streets in those numbers. Right, stuff about it. Anybody who's gone through the, you know, the kind of grief experience of being at 2011 and then coming down afterwards, whatever, right? We were back out. We looked strong again. We looked good. And it seems to me now we have to drive home the message inside every union. That wasn't enough. It was brilliant, but it wasn't enough, right? And stuff. And now we want the talk of the two days, the talk of September. We have to turn that into reality. Hi, uh, my name is Jenna from uh, Sheffield SWP and the Freedom Ride campaign, and also uh, Sheffield Big Bad. <laughs> On the 10th of July in, in Sheffield, we did walk in solidarity with our, our uh, striking workers culminating at the um, uh, War Memorial in Sheffield city centre. Um, if any of you haven't seen the video that this still is taken from, you just Google. Freedom Ride, South Yorkshire, and that's the arrest of one of our peaceful protesters, Mr. Tony Nuttall. Um, on the 10th of July, I stood in solidarity with the care workers who go home to empty kitchen cupboards, the firefighters who can't keep up with their mortgages, the NHS workers whose hours are so much longer but the pay rise so much less than the MPs in government today, the teachers who are drowning in paperwork rather than being allowed to physically spend time with their pupils, the tradespeople who are being forced to contribute such a disproportionately huge amount of their income as opposed to the multinationals like Amazon and companies run by George Osborne's mates. The firefighters, teachers, NHS builders, bakers, council workers, miners, tradespeople, and care workers make up the foundations of the building blocks of our society. United we stand, divided we crumble. If we don't unite, not only here today, but in continuation from this point, then they will topple us. There are many more of us than them, and we will not be snuffed out. If we don't support the Freedom Riders and demand justice for Tony and George, protecting their and your right to protest, and freedom of speech at a basic level, then the unions will be next. You will pay your dues, you will write your reports, and in just a few short years, if we don't challenge this now, we will see police intervention as actions such as the July 10th strike, if proposed anti-union laws are implemented, or grief on the streets. and the rights to protest are of paramount importance. They are cut from the same cloth. Although I was humbled to stand before so many determined and united fighters on July the 10th, I think we all know that given the gravity of the government's impositions, one day of action is not enough. The Freedom Ride has achieved a U-turn in the mobility pass cuts and had them completely reinstated in South Yorkshire. <laughs> direct action. I implore you to return to your unions and campaigns and community groups and network to build solidarity and organise a new strike date sooner rather than later. Solidarity. Thank you. The comment just reminded me, um, it always makes me laugh when um, just like it was on th uh, Thursday, when you had uh, Tory ministers saying, well, we cherish uh, our rights and freedoms to strike, 
but I suppose the, the next line was just don't be don't be irresponsible enough to do it. <laughs> and I just I, I, I think we kind of it was fantastic, wasn't it, on Thursday? And you kind of forget, and I it's the nature of the period that it was only a couple of months ago that a lot of us went into work after the elections, and people were feeling quite, you know, anyone that was a decent anti-racist or a de decent uh, trade unionist were feeling quite demoralised after the kind of UKIP vote and so on. So, Friday was a very different day, wasn't it? And it gave hope because we saw that kind of unity and the, and the possibilities of, of, of a, a serious challenge against austerity. We had a little bit of a, a, a slight problem in Oxford in that uh, the local government had signed a, a, a three, three year pay deal, I think, only for about 1%, uh, which meant they weren't out on strike. Uh, the NUT were a bit worried about the support that they were going to get, so they said they were going to put people on coaches going down to London. So, what we decided to do, we had a comrade in the job centre, we said, look, let's get, try and get people to the picket line, and let's march down for 10 o'clock to welcome the firefighters coming out. And I'll tell you what, it was 50 people, but I'll tell you what, we had a nanny, we had someone out on strike for the first time ever from the GMB, she pretty much her and her mate shut down the local school, and we had you know, different people from different campaigns, and I think it's going to be important as well, from Deepak and all the rest of the councils that came down, in terms of pushing for, 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 for uh, action and so on. So, it was, a, it was a brilliant day, it was a brilliant little uh, rally, but finally, I just want to end on this. I mean, uh, things aren't that straightforward, are they, in terms of, you know, whole numbers of workplaces where we need to, I think, you know, start from uh, scratch. I've just walked in for the first time in 16 years into a place that's, you know, got trade union recognition. Uh, my first email was a, a proposal from Oxfam exec to form a breakaway union, which basically would be a staff association. So we've got that fight on. But it seems to me that actually all the things, interns, we're on pretty much zero hour contracts, all the things that actually we fight and organise around, those are the things that kind of exist in every single workplace. There's an opportunity to do that when you, you know, and the party, there's a resource, there's a lot of knowledge about how you kind of start to build those things. Thanks. Right here, and I've got um, a guy there in the jean jacket. Yeah, I'm Dave Franklin, I'm a PCS activist in the Land Registry of Plymouth. Uh, and I want to tell you about a victory. Uh, apologies for those that heard me say a few words yesterday. Uh, basically, uh, three years ago, the Tories set about trying to privatise the Land Registry. Land Registry is a small department, four, four, just over 4,000 4, 4, people. Uh, they moved us from the MOJ into Biz uh, and then set about trying to privatise us. Um, Sadly, I can't report that we had a brilliant rank and file campaign. We walked out of the cobbles without a ballot. We didn't do that. Actually, we had to wait for nine months, effectively, before we could get a proper trade dispute. But we didn't waste that nine months. We campaigned. We campaigned against the legal profession. We, made, we did a response uh, to uh, the government consultation. We did a, I, I think we did a fantastic thing on social media. We got a 38 degrees petition with 100,000 signatures on it. You know, all, all small stuff, but all actually engaging members at the same time. When we, when we got ourselves a trade dispute, uh, we then had a really sharp argument on, on the group executive committee between those who thought we couldn't do strike action and those that thought we did, or those that thought we should have one day. Members didn't want one day, actually. We've had too many one day strikes. Uh, you know, I don't want to contradict what Michael said. Actually, my members are pissed off going out for one day and not achieving anything. They wanted to do more. In the end, we settled on a two-day strike. We had that strike on the 14th, 15th of May. Fantastically strong strike. Biggest picket lines we've ever seen at land registries across the country. 12 sites. Um, the, the government uh, started to back down. My big boss who they bought in, Ed Lester, a tax avoider that they bought in from the student's loan company, uh, he got a kick in from, from the minister. The minister, Michael Fallon, got a kick in from Cable because, you know, because we had a successful strike. And actually they're back down and we won. We are not being privatised. We can be privatised. <laughs> but the other thing about that, you hear a lot, a lot of the time that people, if, people don't want to go on strike. You know, there was a real worry in land registry. We'd only been on strike a month ago for two days. It's not the same as land, but nevertheless, it's a big hit on your salary. Were people going to come out on the 10th? Well, actually, 
uh, tenth, eleventh, whatever the date was, I forgot the date last Thursday. Um, were people going to come out? Well, actually, we had a bigger strike. We didn't have the bigger picket lines, but we had a bigger strike. People were willing to fight. They understood the arguments. If they didn't understand the arguments, we explained it to them. Uh, you know, it's not actually difficult, is it, to explain? You've got no fucking money. Uh, so we explained it, and we had a bigger, we had a bigger turnout than we did on our own strike. And I think it's a fantastic lesson for us to learn that actually, where we provide leadership. Where we're prepared to engage with our members, where socialists on the ground present the arguments, and both in the, in the branches and in the national organisations, we can fight and we can win. The way we go forward and carry on the fight from, from, from last week is actually to keep fighting and to keep winning. Good morning, Cal Comrades. I'm Gary Gallagher, I'm in the SWP, and I'm from, from Wigan Horvis. Hey. We stood together, there was 200 of us on the picket line, and we got strength from other people that came onto the picket line. Uh, other SD, SWP members, the TUC, and other unions, the teachers, the, even the firefighters were with us on the picket line. And my point is that we were there, there was only 200 of us at the beginning. We were like rabbits, you know, head like rabbits. And we got strength from other people that came onto the picket line and encouraged us on more. So on the first day, we saw these people arrive, we had people standing in front of trucks, nose to nose with trucks. And it just brought us on more. They tried, the management would try to bring these silly rules in. Only six on each gate. Six, there was four gates, so we had 12 people on either side. So what, my, what I'm saying to, to people today is, it's not the fact that there was just 200 of us, there was five, and then there was three, then there was four, then there was 500. And it's not the fact that, we, we were all nervous at the beginning, don't get me wrong. I've never been on strike before. But what I kept saying to people is, it's not the fact that there's just 50 of you, but if you've got a thousand people on that picket line, they, they just shit themselves. Right? I stood there for 10 hours, there was eight managers. They just stood and watched. So what does that tell you? In a working day, what they actually do? <laughs> on about three or four days, there was only one. And on the end of that week, he was in the office looking through a window. We had them backed into the back into the factory. That's that's how we won. And I, I just want to give you an update of what what you can achieve. Before the strike, it's like most factories where you you just go there. It's main day, you know. It's nine to five. There's a lot of people that do shift work, and you're just passing people all the time. You might say the odd hello, but since the strike. It, it's just fantastic, it's just brought us all together. Uh, we've had a bad uh, result at Bradford, but we're ready. We're ready to go again, I tell you that now. We get the, we get the feeling on the, on the shop floor, everybody says we're ready again to go out. But I'd like to just give you an update of what we've achieved since we've gone back. We've, we've lost seven managers. <laughs> Just uh, we've lost the managing director's been sacked. Yeah. Yeah. After, after we came back, we got 12, uh, uh, we took people on who were, were, were sort of uh, temporary, temporary people, we got them on the same terms and conditions as us as well. So that's another win. got a pay rise this year as well and that's only like six months after we've gone back so there's what you can achieve if you just fight them and that's what I'm saying today you've got to get your faces on the picket line it doesn't matter if, if it's you if there's a thousand two thousand people on that picket line like I said it just pushed them back we never saw them we go into work today and they scurry along the walls <laughs> Hands. They need our hands. And you wind up coming. Okay. <laughs> That's a thank you.
Parliament weren't able to take official strike action on Thursday. We faced two hurdles. Firstly, we're in the healthcare industry, and as you know, we didn't get the call out. The second hurdle, I work for a private company operating in partnership with the healthcare industry. So they get to inflict the same insults, I call them insults, I don't call them a pay rise offer. They get to inflict the same damage on the workers, with none of backlash. When you're balloting members in the public sector, don't forget about the private companies operating within the public sector. There's a lot of very angry people there, I'm starting to feel a bit forgotten. And now I'm hearing my members saying, why can't we go out on strike? When are we going out on strike? We've got these problems, we've got the same issues as our colleagues around us. Call us out too. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Um, I'm an engineer at I'm a United Shop steward at Deer Street Donington in Telford and we repair tanks and armored vehicles. That's for the industry we're in. And we weren't on strike on July the 10th because we've got our own pay disputes all going on. But we still we would still be covered by the 1% pay cap. However, we marched out in support of those that were yeah. To a rally, and what made that happen was three SWP members inside that workplace played a crucial role in analysing where we were, what we could do, what we had to do, and winning the shop stewards committee to it, winning the members to it, going out there and saying we have to be in support of those on strike. But that was the first point. The second thing was. Because it's a week before our pay talks, and I can't go into what we're doing, but we're going for 8% because of the situation we're in. And so we're showing a show of strength to management, we're showing a show of strength to, to the employer, and saying, because we marched out to the, the, to the, uh, the chant of they say one, we say eight, and they were going to balance out the gate. <laughs> Because we're really concerned that uh, national officers and you know will compromise and try and sell us out. So we're trying to sow the seeds that if that happens, we will have to go alone. But we will have to take unofficial action, and that's why at the rally it was really encouraging to see McConvener, um that when he said, you know, talking about if they come for us, bring them on because we'll have wildcats. That there was a massive cheer for that, yeah. and so we have to make those arguments nationally so that when the action is called officially it happens and we make that happen as organised revolutionary socialists in the workplace and then we have to make sure it's massive and that then we are prepared to take unofficial action if that's the situation we have to be stronger in the workplace we have to build our organisation in the workplace so that we are in a position to take unofficial action when need be from Leicester SWP, I'm a public sector worker. We're a little branch, but I want to talk a little bit about the success we've had in Leicester. Um, over a number of months, really, um, every time I you know, go to any workplace, they always try and talk about socialism and selling the paper. And it's been quite different this time, because everywhere I went, I was going, are you going out on strike? And I went, yeah, definitely, all the way. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. But, you know, it was really significant that um, more people were coming out uh, than before. Um, and uh, I suppose the other thing is, we're a small section, we've got about 50 people working with us. We've got two SWP shop stewards, but we constantly talk to, we have meetings, we go out and talk to little teams. And out of our section, only two staff crossed the picket line, which is fantastic. 11 people volunteered to pick it from 7 till 10 and came on the rally. The rally was huge, it was massive. But again, it was kind of a bit unconfident. So we got up the megaphone and we did that, you know, um, they say caught back, we say fight back, it was going down really well, really well, really well. We did a few more chants. And I started going, when they say caught back, we say strike. And the first people were going, well, I'm not sure about that, even though they were on strike. But towards the end, they were going, strike, strike. And it was really, really significant. 
We had our biggest paper sale, I mean to you lot it might not seem a lot, we sold 54 papers on that rally because we operated like the same so everybody was selling papers, we had new members and one of them was saying to me, I'm not going to sell any Jackie, I said you will, just show them headlines, show them headlines, he sold three, he was over the moon, so it was really really fantastic and, and absolutely right, we've got to talk to everybody and anybody, they're up for it, people are up for action in, in August, October. There's just one last, one question I want to ask though, um, and it was, what do you think will be the response of the trade union bureaucracy um, over plans about raising the ballot threshold to 40% and what should the response of the left be? Thank you. No, 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 sorry, sorry. Okay, UK striker, well not striker, but soon to be hopefully. Um, followed by Rob. Hello, um, I'm Andy Squires, I'm a unionist in the shop steward, and I work for probably the, one of the most inappropriately named companies <laughs> <laughs> in this which I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. 31 years ago, I started working for the NHS and I thought I was going to be safe and secure for life. How wrong was I? This uh, wonderful company came across and bought the contract and we started working for them last September. As most of you know, we've had 34 days strike action so far and next Wednesday the legal ballots that's in process at the moment will be counted. Hopefully, we'll be back out again. Mm -hmm. I can't emphasise more the old saying of strength in numbers. You need it when you're not going on strike. These people, if you keep fighting, you can make them worried and eventually, eventually they will listen. And we're not giving up. There's still the hardcore of us left that want to fight this company. We will keep fighting them. So keep doing it. Solidarity. Thanks for that. I really enjoyed this what people have been saying. I, mean, I want to go through the experience of what's happened in our place in my school and what I think some of the lessons are actually really some questions about kind of hopefully my thoughts about where to go forward. I, mean, I work in a major academy in South London. There was virtually no union organisation. Um, we got we such a high turnover of staff that one very few people struck on November 11th, uh, so November 2011. And also there's so many new staff in the school. It's not a sort of a memory if you like of struggle. We rebuilt the union quite substantially before the first strike this year to so shut the school. I think we went from about 14 members to about 46. So we had a very strong strike. Um, what's happened over the course of the year is the numbers politically involved in the strike have increased. There's about four of us on the picket the first time, five or six the second, two people came on the demo. This time, one, it helped massively having nine GMB members, a small TA army, led by this, uh, actually, TA, TS My Class, who turns out her grandmother was secretary to Sylvia Pankhurst. So they say, the, the things you learn on strike can be truly bizarre sometimes. <laughs> but what I wanted to kind of to question is, my experience of the strike, and talking to other young teachers that I know around the network seems to be similar, is that as the strike's gone on, we've sort of lost, slowly lost the numbers striking. We're still struggling to shut the school, but you lose people around the edge, while the political core of it has increased. And I thought you saw that in the demonstrations the last time around. The demonstrations were bigger, and the number of people turning out to demos were bigger, even though the strike itself, the people motivated, motivated primarily around pay, um, couldn't necessarily see the argument for continuing to go out and continue to lose days' pay. And I felt it was easier this time because the strikes were closer together, and that we lost less people because there was more of a sense of, not what I'd have seen of escalation, but the fact that the strikes were coming closer together meant something to people that were kind of less, um, less engaged in the union than the debates in the union, if you like. But two things that did trouble me for the way forward. One is that, and um, I take Michael's point that it's hard to move over, harder to sell out over pay than it is over pensions. But I could be wrong, but I think the local government's association, who the public sector strikes are against in pay, changed from being the Tories to Labour in September, which will surely have an impact on both the nature of the deal will change slightly, and also Unison's desire to cut a deal with a Labour-led um, body will change, and that might have an impact. 
So the, the way that we've tried to round it out is one, by focusing the political stuff much more around October 18th, when we go back, it'll be about the demonstration and what we do, and trying to use the standard education stuff to link into what is a small but real people's assembly growing in Croydon. But the kind of the main argument we've used over strike action is because we're an academy chain, performance related pay is the issue that affects most of us. Our targets come down from OCL Central, so they're completely unmeetable. And then we get, you kind of get told, it's how well you can evidence you've moved towards your targets, which of course is completely subjective and means that a whole number of people are going to get failed. So our argument is much more around the strength of the strike in the school is primarily around what OCL will do to us, rather than the actual issues around pay and pensions. And I suppose I wanted to ask about this, it does feel a little bit like you can motivate them to strike politically in the big strikes. There's not a lot of belief that we can win with the current strategy. And thinking about how we try to use local issues to build seems to be more successful in pulling people out. And if people want to read about the SOAS folks, I'll finish on this. There's a lot of interesting lessons about how the SOAS fractional is organised around that issue. And there's people here you can talk to more about how that took place. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously for um, a lot of people in this room and, and much wider, I think the 10th of July would have been like, you know, a big breath of fresh air really after, after you know, the last couple of years that we've seen. And I suppose part of that is probably because, you know, people look at, um, you know, the build up to general election, might have not expected that we would see the possibility of action, um, you know, op opening up again as the, you know, the pressure comes in to, um, to get behind Labour and push for um, voting for Labour as a solution. But I think what you can really see through quite a lot of the union conferences this year, particularly the unison ones, is that you know, the leadership really are caught between you know these kind of two two pressures really on the one hand there's a sort of you know pessimism from the top about the you know what members are up for on the ground and about the disconnect and a reluctance to to call further action but there's also you know a real drive actually for them to lead a, lead a fight back to the scale of the attacks that are being put through you know in fact you see labor coming out basically and build up the strike and saying yeah we're going to you know we're just going to basically put, put through the same the same attack um, on pay, we're going to, we've got the same policies on pay as what the Tories have. There's not really a lot of um, a lot of wriggle room for them. And I think when you think about the context of frustration and build up to the strikes that people have people have sort of went through since 2011, you know, it was this brilliant year where you went from starting off with student student um, resistance at the beginning of the year, going through the strikes, you had the Occupy movement, Egyptian Revolution. You know, it was this fantastic year that sort of ended with this massive. Um, massive strike and really, really hopeful. And I think you know everything right now about the context is marked by you know the frustration of the past couple of years that that hasn't that, that hasn't you know been it's taken a while to get that followed up again. Um, and I think that you know there's two mistakes really that I suppose we can make in that context. And one is you know you could see in uh, around some of the left, and also it shapes you know the actions of some of the activists involved in building the strike feeling a bit um, you know. Like it's a bit harder to, to, to build up the strikes, and there's not the same rolling momentum building up to 10th of July. Is that you can be a bit dismissive because we saw what Unison did before, we saw you know that the, the action wasn't followed up last time. So is it really going to happen happen this time? And it, you know, one of one of the um, examples of um, how, te how terrible you can end up in a, in a wrong position over that is what happened at Whips, Whips Cross Hospital, where you have activists coming back from a conference where essentially the bureaucracy is pushing um, to get the activists to go out and build towards a strike ballot, and you've got um, you know, the, um, one, of, one of the, uh, the branch secretary, that Unison branch, at that moment, pulling away and, and getting pulling people in to unite, because Unison aren't, see, see it as a union, it's not going to fight. Um, and I think you know, th that kind of cynicism, I suppose, it, it misses the kind of transformative impact that the strikes can have. Um, you know, when, when people, you know, it's, we're at Marxism today, one Marxist concept is that people change through struggle and that, you know, when, when there was one and a half billion people out on strike the other day, it would have gone quite a way to boost people's confidence back up again. Now, of course, if we don't see a follow-up of action, you know, it can slide back again, but we have to see these days as moments, really, where we have to leap in there and have the arguments about, um, you know, about what's going to happen next, about what the strategy is to win and so on and, and, and not fall into that kind of feeling of, oh God, are we just going to end up having a, having a repeat of what happened before? But the other mistake is that you, you end up just being a cheerleader for the action and that you know, ties into that really. We have to be using those moments as a chance to um, you know, speak to people when, when they're a bit more up about you know, looking at the lessons from 2011, looking at the fact that we need to keep, make sure that, that that balance of pressure on the bureaucracy is tipped on the side of, of, of pushing them to call, call more action. And so people have mentioned the United Resistance Conference quite a lot, um, but people should look up for it because 10th of July was a moment where people were really, really up. We're just a week, a week on from that, really. If you're going to go back from Marxism, I think that's an opportunity really to go around and sign people up. It's talking about it, talking about what comes next, really. Thanks.
Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Weiner. I'm on uh, the ECU NEC. And we're in a very strange position where we're not on strike over pay. We've won a 2% pay rise uh, through a, um, uh, a dispute that actually was significantly de escalated by our trade union leadership. I mean, the FE are in a slightly different, um, slightly different position. But one of the things they're talking about now is that what the National <coughs> Union want to do is they do actually, as you know, Rob was talking about, but they want to localise the actions. They want to localise the disputes. They want Lambert to support Lambert. But what they don't want to do is send solidarity speakers all around the country. What they don't want to do is actually make local issues national issues. And they're the sorts of things who are really going to keep us going over the next few, uh, next few months. We're not going to be able to have a ballot over pay until 2015, until next year. Although, I'll tell you what we are going to be doing, we're going to be looking at what Hovis did over the, the zero hours contracts, and in AG we're going to have a big fight, we're going to work for a big fight over zero hours contracts um, in, the, in the coming term. And I think what we have to do is think very, very carefully. Not all of us are in the, in, you know, in the public sector are able to go and strike, but actually we can give solidarity. We've got to actually hold our trade union leaders to account. We can make a difference to them as well, you know. Um, Sally Hunt on the, in the ECU, um, it, not my, my favourite person in, in, in the world, but actually she is pulled by her arguments on HEC that, you know, we do need to uh, have national levies, we do need to send these people on speaking tours, we do need to, you know, she was the first any, um, uh, uh, trade union leader to actually say she sports stand up against UKIP and label them as a racist party. And it's these things we've got to tie together, and on the one hand, you know, be the tension between us and the leadership. But on the other hand, uh, hold them to account for what they say and make sure that they do exactly what they argue for. But actually, we don't want to localise our disputes. We don't want them around local issues. We want to nationalise them as much as possible. Yeah, I want to respond in a serious way to the points that Rob from Croydon raised because they're important issues and I want to say that I agree with some of the things he raised but I have some disagreements with how it sounded to me how he was posing it so firstly I agree completely about the importance of October the 18th you've got what will be a few months before a general election all of the major trade union leaders calling a national demonstration on Britain needs a pay rise yeah, that's very very important it's not the normal thing that would happen that close to an election and in every union we have to take that call seriously and put ourselves at the center of maximizing the turnout for that demonstration if there are hundreds of thousands of people marching through london on that day saying britain needs a pay rise that will strengthen the combat and the resolve of our side to take the fight forward i also agree more specifically with the point raised in my union the nut that because of this new, without going into the new system that Gove's got for pay, will mean in the autumn, in school after school, there will be people who will suddenly find they're not getting the pay rise that they normally would expect to get. And that should be the spark for people pushing for strike action in those schools. And the National Union will give strike action, paid strike action around that. We should seize every opportunity to do that because that will build organisation and strength at the base of the union. So that's fine, I agree with all of that, we have to take that seriously. What slightly concerned me, however, was, and maybe Rob didn't intend this, was it was almost a talk to counterpose those two things to a drive towards further national strike action. And I think to come back to the point Michael made, that the demonstrations are vitally important, so is the local action. But you cannot defeat a government on austerity and pay by, those, by demonstrations and local action. We need more and bigger national strike action. <laughs> Every union, if you're in health, agitating for the national strike action, that's been the ballot and the strike action that's been talked about. In local government, turn, agitating to turn the talk about more strike action into reality. And I tell you, if unions like the NUT, if health workers are out and council workers out, we have to be seeing, our duty is to be out alongside those on another July the 10th, but this time bigger and stronger, whenever that day is called. And while all that's going on, and we're the NUT, we are effectively going to have a new national ballot in the autumn, where our union leaders are going to propose a series of strikes that will be from you know, October, November on into the spring, and we'll have an online ballot in reality about that. But we have to say we're in favour of agitating on the ground, school meetings and so on, to make sure that's won, and the ballot is won, and that escalated action takes place. But it's very important, the timescale on that will be late October into November. 
I tell you, that's not an excuse, but if the health workers and the council workers come out in September or October, say, we don't do that, we wait till we've completed our ballot. We do both. We have our ballot for escalation and push for that, but when the health workers and council workers are, we're out with them anyway. We don't need a ballot to do that. We did it last week and we should do it again. So yes to build the demonstration, yes to every local action, but it has to be back to national strike action is the only way to break this government or austerity and fear. Uh, Helen Davis, uh, Barnet Unison, uh, if people didn't know already. Um, <laughs> Barnet Council is a vicious Tory council. It is the sort of councillors that sit on that council in the cabinet. One of them said on a twi tweet, um, I get so excited I feel like Harold Shipman in a nursing home. Um, <laughs> we, uh, and that, I kid you not, that's the sort of language they come out with. They've referred to protesters in the gallery as sad old hags and had um, and had applause within the council chamber for that. Um, they went on a programme, worked on a programme of privatisation, but that was five years ago and they are furious with the local branch, Barnett Unison branch, that we held them off for five years, taking strike action um, against the change of identity of the employer. The first wave of privatisation went through, we lost that, and the, and the result has been 350, around 350 job losses. And for our care workers in your choice, Barnet, it's meant um, cuts to terms and conditions. We also have, however, we did win a claim against the council that Unison took around the poor information on agency data and got a payout of £600,000 to um, a load of colleagues who were affected by that lack of data. So the Tories were hopping mad. We've cost them several, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds. And they went for the union branch, cutting facility time. On the 1st of April, it felt like an April full day, full call. They said, you, me and the branch secretary, you two are back in your workplaces. On, Wednesday, on, on the 1st of April, irrespective of the fact you're representing people in disciplinaries, you're uh, involved in negotiations, GMB are going to that. Um, well, they blinked, we're still in the unison office because they've worked out that actually they do need to talk to the unions. We had um, a campaign around facility time, we used a, a video, a, a member came up with a song called Bob in Barn, it's on YouTube. Um, and in the midst of all of this, um, your choice Barnet workers who've been privatised face a 10% wage cut. They were balloted, um, they, they balloted 100% voted in favour of taking strike action and will have the negotiations on this Tuesday their full pay will be reinstated one month only, pending negotiations tomorrow. And if those negotiations fail, then we'll be sending out a notice for industrial action for the following week. Catch my breath. Um, we've got in the council restructures, we're um, going to be pulled out of national pay bargaining and further privatisation on the rest of us. And in the face of that, you just think, <laughs> um, I regularly do feel like that, but it is, it is the case that our members want to come out. They came out around 1 in 10, actually actively took part in, in the action that were balloted. Um, and uh, we're still fighting, we're still here, and you will be hearing a lot more of me going on about Barnet, I, I dare say. And the sweet thing is, Bob, the real Tory councillor, did lose his job in the elections. The Tories are hanging on by one seat only. Oh. Time, and I'm sorry to all the other people who've had loads and loads of hands up, so I apologise, John. If you had asked anyone honestly a week ago about how they felt the 10th of July would be, the reply you would have got from every single one of them would, we're nervous. We're nervous about when we can pull it off. And the truth is the 10th of July was much better than anyone expected. Leadership of the union, rank and file, us. And I think it tells you something very fundamental, because if you look at the strike, it was strongest and most enthusiastic. The lower paid people were, the more the bitterness. In schools, I know teachers are nervous, understand it for years, more schools shut because we had United Strike Action. You know, don't get many people from the GMB at a meeting like this. The GMB strike was excellent everywhere. Why is that? If you look at the level of attack on our pay, and they project carrying on pay restraint through to 2020, you're talking about real pay being cut by 30 to 40%. And you cannot do that without their bigger level of resistance and without unions' leadership 
feeling they have to reflect that. So it's a very fundamental thing that's going on. And it's not going to go away. It's not a one-off. But it is an important moment. What happens in this dispute is important. And because of an unevenness and lack of confidence, when you have an unevenness and lack of confidence, leadership is all the more important. And decisiveness and boldness is important. The fact that they called the strike got the response. But we need to fight now to name the further days before the wobbling and the vacillation starts. Because I guarantee you, I'm actually surprised that I've heard it at Marxism. I normally hear it from Dave Prentice or Heather Wakefield. The strike was great on Friday. By Monday, it weren't as good as you thought. By, by Friday after, it's a disaster. Most helpful strike ever had. We should have, I don't think people on the left should repeat that kind of nonsense. The strike was very good. If we win the fair the fight, if I was in the school, I'll tell you what I would do. I would go teachers, unison, GME members together. I would say, let's all of us write to our local union and our national figures and say, we want the date for further strikes now. We want it named, we do. Last point I want to make is this a rather different point. Something about the mood, about unity. And I think it's very different. And I'll tell you, I'm a, give me a little moment on this. I, when I was a civil servant, one of the good things I did, I had to go down Fleet Street where there were spies at GCH and they took their union rights away. And we went to the print workers to try and get them out on strike. And they were quite friendly, but Sean Geraghty, a very good communist guy, I couldn't even speak to him, because I was a lovely civil servant. They kept me in an anti room and sent me someone out. And the unions, the, the print unions, there was the EPTU, the NGA and SOGA, and they never struck together, because any one of them on their own could shut the press. And they kind of took it, they wouldn't speak to us. They did strike and say it was fantastic, but that mood is very different now. The separation between the unions, people like the unity, partly because people don't feel strong and confident. The idea we should strike together and work together, I think is much greater inside the working class movement than it was. And therefore, the Unite the Resistance conference really can strike a chord with people. Because we do need to build something on the ground that comes out of it. Because we know this, when the union leaders give a lead, it opens the door. But all of us know we can't trust them, right? In unison, that's not very hard to say. Everyone knows you can't trust a apprentice. But we can't trust, I mean, I'll tell you this, I don't trust myself. I'm a grand secretary, I want to be under pressure from the rank of file. One of the reasons I'm in an organisation like the SWP, I want to be under the organised pressure of the working class because any leader on their own isn't good enough. We need organisation. So let's go on and build it. The first thing I think that, we've got a picture, right, stuff of what's going on in the world around us, which is not that there are these evil officials simply holding back the struggle and the massive, the massive workers are just trying to break through. Go back to it. People aren't confident, right, in this situation. And it means when they get a lead, it makes an enormous difference, right, stuff. When you talk about, this, you know, the fact that at Care UK, at Hope, and the rest of it, people are able to come out the door. Once people come out the door, right, so they do magnificent, magnificent things, right, so, uh, and it's a picture of, 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 of how things open. But at the minute, that role with the officials, right, so, whether they open it up at a local or national level, is absolutely, it, it is absolutely critical. So we've got to think about how we build up the pressure, right, and stuff to, to, to open, open, open the door up. And there's a couple of things I wanted to say, really. So the thing is, local disputes are enormously important. It will be ridiculous to argue, you know, well, we just talk about the national, don't worry about your conditions and the rest of it. If you're in a workplace, if you're in an academy, if you're in different places, you have to think about developing a strategy inside these places where there's levels of organisation that can fight over issues. It's right what Paul says, at the minute, over a whole number of things, if you're a teacher, for example, there is a blank check at the minute for industrial action. What is that about? If you go over a local dispute and just look each week in Social Worker at the pages where there's been disputes and strikes and the rest of the stuff around. So this is stuff is critical, but if we're talking about a situation where we're not back in the 50s and 60s, where we're building up from the shop floor right, and stuff year by year, rank and file confidence over economic issues and the rest of it, if we're talking about an enormously politicised period where people ain't confident, the argument about the national cuts. Because I don't want to go out on my own, I want to go out of other people. I know my issues over pay, but I care about the health service. Right? So I care about all these kind of things, and that's why people start coming up right, when you get the idea of national action. Now, of course, the stop and start thing is a massive problem. The stop and start thing is a problem. We're all obviously in a whole number of unions in an argument. In the NUT, there's been a big row going on for years now about do you escalate? Is it crazy to argue about escalate? Is, have you got the strength for the rest of it? But the bit that worries me about, see, 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 partly, there's an argument, for example, about a kind of social trade union model. People talk about Chicago and the strikes, and it's true. It's brilliant strikes by teachers in Chicago and the rest of it. And actually, one of the things they did was go out and fight for their, to win support politically in their community. That was really, really important, but they also come out and strike. Right, so they built, they built, 
by doing all the right things politically, but by coming out the door. And if we've got an argument which we have to gradually build up strength, etc., etc., but so while people are getting fucking hammered nationally and stuff, but I don't believe that will break through. And so therefore, and stuff, we've got a really, we have to be absolutely arguing hard about the national action. We have to argue with people around us about the national action. If people are saying stuff, the pace of it ain't good enough, I feel like dropping off a little bit about this, right, stuff, you know, the, the pay, you know, we'll never break through on pay and the rest of it. We've got to argue good. I agree with you on a number of them things, but what's the answer to it? It's not not coming out, it's coming out for two days. It's coming out more often, right, stuff about it. And therefore, so what socialists do now in the next couple of weeks and months is going to be important. There's no point us, you know, either, either rolling our shoulders or just throwing rocks and waiting for Dave Prentice to sell out. There might be all sorts of reasons why they might pull back in local government, right, and stuff. Whether it's who runs the authority, whether they get the nod and the wink from Ed Miliband and the rest of it, but the bit we know is if we don't create pressure, if we don't create part of creating pressure on him, right, stuff, so he will pull the plug on the bloody thing. And so we have to use the opportunities we've got, and that's the bit that goes to it and stuff. Every time they give us an official call, we have to use the official call as a, as a, as a way of building self activity underneath it. Everything is about pushing it. Just ask two quick things. I mean, actually, you know, he's just walking out, just walk, walking out of the room. Come on, he's a firefighter walking out of the back, right, Simon? Right, and stuff. The last, the, the last strike that happens, right, stuff about it. Lots of places around the country, there's been a problem with picketing. So what does Simon do? He went have a couple, a couple of FBU uh, mem members up there. They called a demo. 300 firefighters turn up to the demonstration. Shockingly, it wasn't a problem of, of involvement on the day. There was, a, there was an official call. He used it to get rank and file self-activity. Doug Morgan, who's a comrade, who was uh, in the room, he was as a dog last night, right, chaired the rally in Birmingham that Dave Prentice was speaking at, right, and did a beautiful piece of audience participation. While standing next to Dave Prentice, he said, hands up, he wants to be out in September. Whoosh! <laughs> so, so in other words, he uses the official call to strengthen the self-activity of the class and put pressure on the bloody officials. And therefore, I agree with everybody who's worried with Prentice, etc, etc, will play the past, I'll write to be worried about it, but how do we deal with it? We deal with a problem, right, stuff, not by waiting for the sellout, right, stuff, but by trying to get our class strong enough and organised enough so it's got a chance to break through, and that is two or three levels. Everybody's workplace, we need to pass something through saying we want to come out in September. And the sisters raised the argument about, about, about places that have been privatised or opted out and the rest of it. We should be putting the argument. We're being hammered. If they're coming out in September, why can't we fight in September? If we're in a private sector workplace and we've got a dispute, we should say the obvious thing. If they name dates in September, we want to be out with them. That's the important thing. The last thing is about the network thing, right? Over, because of course, we should, you know, we, we do we need to be involved in all sorts of attempts to build networks together around the trades councils, around the people's assemblies, etc, etc. They're important to do that, but what we do know, I mean the people's assembly demonstration was brilliant the other day and stuff, and it was good going to the conference, but what we do know is actually one that you can't mention the war. Right, so about it. If you raise the fact, right, so it strikes are brilliant, and then when the strikes don't happen, there's no argument, it's just on to the demo. Right, so we've had the strike, then the demo and the rest of it. We have to have somewhere where people can come together and organise their event, but also they can talk about how to win. And that's why the Art of Resistance Initiative is important for us, because we want to pull together the best fighters, we want to give them a place where they can build solidarity for one another, but also where they can have a discussion about how do we stop coming out every <coughs> six months over the thing, how do we build up momentum and crack the government, because the government's got its problems. Open the pages and the newspapers this morning and stuff and look at the government's problems and every bloody issue around it and stuff. And that means for us, we have to go out and fight like mad over the next few weeks and stuff. We have to raise it. They said two days in September. They said they're coming out in the autumn. We want to put the money where the mouth is. We want the strikes called.